Congressman, number 270, number 270. Certainly hope this is not the night that you've been looking forward to. But it seems as though that uh, that was one of the things that we were told when we were young that is absolutely the truth. And that is that the older you get, the faster time goes, or at least it seems that way. And I've tried to philosophically look at the reason behind that and have not yet been able to put my finger on just exactly why that is. But... Nonetheless, it seems as though that even in difficult times that time flies exceedingly fast. We've always said that time flies when you're having fun, but I've come to realize that when you're not having that much fun at all, it still flies. So, so when we begin an effort such as we did just a few days ago, then it really should not surprise us that here we are by the good providence of God that we are concluding this gospel meeting this evening. How many gospel meetings have you been a part of in your lifetime? How many times have you brought to a conclusion a series concerted as we have been this week? Well, a bunch. And as we do that, it's good for us to do a little bit of reflecting, I think. It's always good for us to take a spiritual inventory of ourselves. I mean, if we could do it on a regular basis, there's no doubt about it that we'd be better off. We know that as Paul was writing to the church at Corinth in the second epistle in chapter 13 at verse 5, he said, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own self. Know ye not your own selves. How that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. Now what he's saying there, obviously, is that they were required to take a personal spiritual inventory of themselves. They were to put themselves to the test. And the reason why they were to put themselves to the test was for ascertaining just exactly where they were, spiritually speaking. Where are we? Now, I don't mean in this building, you know. I mean, where are we, spiritually speaking? And the way that Paul describes the situation there at Corinth was they could make a determination as to whether they were in the faith or not in the faith, which is just another way of saying it. They could determine whether they're saved or whether they're lost where they're supposed to be or where they're not supposed to be, whether they're prepared for eternity or they're not prepared for eternity. And friends and brethren, every one of us can know that exact same thing if we so desire. We can know whether we're ready for the Lord to return. And at the same time, we can know that we're lacking in preparation for the Lord's return. And the smart thing to do, of course, would to be, uh, to be always ready ready and looking forward to the Lord's return. Realizing that this world is not our home, we're just passing through, we should not feel so at home in this world because we're only going to be here for a very brief period of time. If we were to live to be as old as Methuselah, that's still a drop in the bucket to eternity. Therefore, let's make our calling and our election sure. And especially this evening, as we examine a topic that I am convinced is highly, highly important. And what we're going to do is set the tone for where we're going to go in this lesson by reading the last few verses of Paul's second epistle to this young preacher by the name of Timothy as it involves not only the obligation of a gospel preacher, which is exactly, of course, as what Timothy was, but the principles that we'll see that apply especially to preachers don't just apply to preachers. They apply to everyone. If you are a member of the body of Christ, and by the way, God requires everybody in the whole wide world to become a child of God. Therefore, when we find the responsibility that, that a Christian possesses, then we are finding, in fact, a responsibility that everybody in the whole wide world possesses because everybody in the world ought to be a Christian. Everybody in the world could be a Christian. Everybody in the world will one day wish they were a Christian. I promise you that. Therefore, the things that we learn that apply specifically in this instance to Timothy, a gospel preacher, will at the same time apply to us in principle. And that's what we're going to be trying to look at in this lesson this evening specifically. Notice what Paul says. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, 
charity or love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now notice specifically there as to the fellowship involved in what he's saying here and the joint participation that this young preacher will have with others who, quote, unquote, call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, out to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now notice the terrible predicament that inspiration uses to describe the individual who is in fact his own worst enemy. Can you imagine that somebody would be out to no good concerning themselves? And that that's exactly the way the person that is in the snare of the devil is in. He's in a position where he is in fact opposing himself. He is not out for his own best interest. He is standing in the way of himself enjoying the blessings that are available. And of course, there's a number of reasons why he might think he's doing the right thing, but he's not. How could such a situation as that exist? And what, in essence, does this chapter end in seemingly finding a support for what Paul is trying to accomplish in this section of Scripture? Well, here's the, what we're going to be getting at in this lesson. A number of years ago, I was given the opportunity on a Sunday afternoon to watch the Braves play. And during that ball game, well, not during the ball game, but after the ball game was over, there was this old fellow by the name of Carl Walenda who walked across a tightrope over Fulton County State. I couldn't hardly believe it. I barely could watch. You talk about a fellow who was balanced. Now, in that sense of the term, Carl Walenda was very balanced. And if you haven't looked at the title for the lesson we're going to be examining this evening, then it is to do with this matter of balance. And how that, not just a gospel preacher like Timothy, not just a gospel preacher like the Apostle Paul, but every child of God of which we all should be is required to be balanced. But friends... Obviously, when we use a term like balanced, I guarantee you it would be very unlikely that we would all be on the same page regarding our definition of balance. I mean, we talk about Carl Walenda, he's balanced, but obviously that's not what we're talking about. We're not even talking about here this individual who's a little heavy, you know, and he's trying to balance here on this tight rope too. That's not the type of balance we're talking about. And yet there are principles even regard that you could apply to those individuals and the ability that they have to stay straight where they need to be and not fall over to one side or the other. Is there something in that that maybe God has directed us to stay balanced and not be guilty of going to one side or the other? Well, of course there is. Notice some examples. Balance is required, and many examples show us that to be the case. Remember, there was a generation of Israelites. The nation had been whittled down somewhat in that all of those adults, 20 years old and older, who had griped and complained because they wanted the green leafy vegetables that they were eating back in Egypt instead of the manna and the quail they were eating in the wilderness, God let that generation die out in the wilderness. That's one way to get rid of complainers. You let them wander until they die. Well, now they're children. They're nieces and the nephews. Those who were not guilty of griping and complaining and murmuring against God, they are now going to be going into the land of Canaan. And notice some of the specific words that are used to encourage them as they make their way across the Jordan River under the leadership of Joshua into the land of Canaan. You shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or the left hand. Sounds like to me, that what God through Moses encouraged them to do is to be balanced in their pursuit of faithfulness in the land of Canaan to where they go. Not going to the left hand, not going to the right hand. Staying 
right there with the truth. Now, you know as well as I that sometimes people take this terminology and they make applications in the political arena. Some people are called right-wingers and some people are called left-wingers, you know. But see, in those areas, we're generally not talking about objective truth. Here, we're talking about objective truth. To deviate from the truth of God's word, either to the right or the left, is, guilt, is, is damnable. You see, it doesn't matter whether you're in the left ditch or the right ditch. If you're in the ditch, it's still the ditch. And there is no reason for us to be in either one of the ditches. We can stay right with the truth and can be perfectly balanced in that. Does it surprise us then that when Joshua takes over for Moses, here are the words that God uses to encourage Joshua. Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand nor to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Now it sounds like to me there that there is an encouraging word given by God to Joshua that if he does not deviate from the way that he ought to go, if he doesn't go to the right or to the left, then he is going to be successful in leading the children of Israel. Why, pray tell, would someone then deviate from the prescribed way in which he's supposed to go? Did Joshua do a pretty good job of that? Absolutely he did. What was God expecting out of Joshua? What he was expecting out of the children of Israel in general? That they be perfectly balanced, walking in truth, not deviating to the right or to the left. Well, do you think that there's maybe a principle in there that applies to us? Absolutely. Absolutely. But we'll have to get more specific, though, in regards to what that is. Notice another example. It's toward the end of the life of this great leader, Joshua. And as he is fixing to go the way of all mankind, he's fixing to die, he says this in his last speech to the children of Israel. Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And then, of course, the more famous verse is the next one in which he says, Choose you this day whom you'll serve. Remember, he says, For me and my house will serve the Lord. But notice the point that he makes here relative to this matter of balance. In order for these brethren, these Israelites, to be and do what God would have them to be, then there are two qualifications to their following the Lord. They are going to be serving the Lord, notice what he says, in sincerity and in truth. Notice he did not say, serve the Lord in sincerity, but don't worry about the truth. And he did not say, serve the Lord in truth, but don't worry about the sincerity. What is required of these brethren is a principle that applies to us as well that we'll show here in a minute. It's exactly what we must do is serve the Lord in sincerity, but also serve the Lord in truth. You know as well as I that we live in a world in which people actually think that as long as a person is sincere, then that's really all that matters. That that accounts for being the right thing if they are sincere enough. And by that strange set of reasonings, then when four guys would hijack a jet and fly it into the twin tires, then that was the right thing for them to do. Because they sincerely believed they was doing the right thing, didn't they? So instead of getting upset with them, we ought to applaud them for being so sincere. That's ludicrous, friends. Was not Paul convinced that he ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which things he also did? What was Paul doing? He was doing everything he could to stamp out Christianity. Why? Because he sincerely believed that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. Well, we all let him alone then. Let him keep on doing his sincere thing. But that's not what the Lord thought. As he needed to know that sincerity alone is not enough. And friends, just as surely as it was not enough for Saul of Tarsus, it was not enough for those hijackers, it was not enough for those of Joshua's day and the children of Israel, it's not enough for us. While we must be sincere, there's something else required. And that is, we must be right too. 
And that's not braggadocio either. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. We need to be right and sincere at the same time. And sadly, did you realize that the only area that sincerity alone is allowed is in the area in which it should not be allowed, and that is our soul and its eternal destiny. Could you imagine? Here you get a bill from, from the telephone company. Your bill is 500 and something dollars. It usually runs around 100. And you call them, they say, well, somebody sincerely wrote down the wrong number. That won't go, folks. They sincerely think you used three times as much electricity this month as you did last month. That doesn't work. They sincerely think because they're looking at you that you've got something in you that they need to cut out. And so the doctor sincerely opens you up and there's nothing there to take out. We do not allow people to reason like that in any other area of our existence except in the area of our spiritual condition. And then it's eternally dead. Sadly in death. Sincerity and truth. Now, does this sort of remind you of another principle? When Jesus was in conversation with a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Because the Father seeketh such to worship him. God's spirit, they that worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Notice, not worship just in spirit. Notice, not worship just in truth, but worship God in spirit and in truth. You know there's an example back in the first chapter of the book of Isaiah in which here were the children of Israel who were offering the exact right sacrifice at the exact right time. They were observing the days just exactly the way they were supposed to be observed. They were saying the words to the prayers just exactly as they were supposed to be worded. And through it all, God said, if you can't do any better than that, you'd be better off staying at home because I'm not going to hear your prayer. Why? Because these very same people are the ones that Jesus quotes from Isaiah when they draw nigh to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart far, far, far away. Doing the right thing, but sincerity... Are you kidding? For far too long, a whole generation, my generation, was led to believe that as long as we don't have a piano in the building and as long as we don't have a woman in the pulpit, then that guarantees that our worship is acceptable. No, it doesn't. If our worship is acceptable, there's not going to be a woman in the pulpit and there's not going to be instrumental music in our worship, but there's more involved in true worship by true worshipers than just that. Our heart must be involved in what we're doing. The children of Israel of Isaiah's day were doing the right things. But where was their heart? They said, well, I wish we'd get done with this so I'd go home and do what I want to do. Don't you know what the first pitch is at 801? My, my, how times have not changed. Balanced, in spirit, and in truth. Both are required. It would be absolutely wrong for us to build one of these up to the exclusion of the other. We would sin when we did that. Notice also, and this has a specific application, obviously, to preachers, but here's Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 at verse 10. Jeremiah says, or God says to Jeremiah, See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. Now if you'll notice those six things that are used to describe the work that Jeremiah is going to be doing for God as his spokesman, four of the six are negative. Big time negative. Which leaves only two of the six or one third to be positive. And then it's of course just a coincidence but when Paul told Timothy Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. One third of the requirements of Paul to Timothy is positive, and two thirds is negative. Now, I'm not about to try to get you to believe that two thirds of the things that a preacher says is supposed to be negative, and one third is supposed to be positive to fit this divine model. 
But friends, there is such a thing as being balanced in the pulpit. And we recognize that if we're trying to be true to God's word. That we cannot be all positive and we cannot be all quote unquote negative. There is a balance that must be hit and we must ever strive to be balanced in those areas. And one other example. When Jesus told the apostles, of course, in Matthew chapter 16, when he and the apostles came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi and he began to ask them, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they were given all these wrong answers, obviously. They were thinking he was a resurrected from the dead Old Testament prophet or a resurrected from the dead John the Baptist. Well, he wasn't. And then he turned the attention, of course, of the apostles, and Peter said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And then notice what he said. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Did you realize? that most of the problems that exist among brethren is derived from a failure to see the distinction between those things that are bound and those things that are loosed. I promise you. When people treat those things that God has bound as if they are not bound, that causes problems. For those who recognize that matters that are bound must be considered bound. And when people treat matters that are loosed, in which there is no specific pattern to be followed, they treat those matters as if they are set in concrete, then that's just as bad. Making laws for God is just as bad as setting aside the laws that God has. What do we need to do? We need to be careful. We need to not make laws where God doesn't have laws, and we certainly do not need to set aside laws that God has. We have to be balanced. And when people treat bound things as if there are loose things or treat loose things as if there are bound things, they make a terrible mistake, do a disservice to the cause of Christ, and cause difficulties among brethren that ought not to even have to be dealt with. That happens way too many times. When Jesus said, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, the literally, the, the force of the verb is, it will literally already have been settled in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. Now, what's the practical application of that matter? On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and when, the Peter, when Peter and the rest of the apostles said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. That was not something that the apostles decided to write into their sermon on Saturday night before that sermon. That was already settled in heaven. That was a matter that was already set in the stone of divine decree before it was ever, ever said by the apostles. And when a matter is loosed, it's a matter that already always has been loosed in heaven. The same principle. There must be balance. But what's the essential ingredient that gets us to the point where we can actually do that? I mean, clearly, and we could even expand on this concept further and look in other areas and the absolute necessity of being balanced. But how can we do that? Let me tell you something. There is absolutely no way that we can live the balanced life that God demands that we live if we do not know what the Bible teaches. Can't do it. We have to know what God has said in his word before we can apply what God says in his word. That's why gospel meetings are so important. That's why vacation Bible schools are so important. That's why lectureships are so important. That's why we have Bible classes on Sunday and on Wednesday night. It's because you simply cannot do what those things accomplished without them. You can't do it. We're so thankful that there are people who are willing to come over to Chattanooga on a Monday night now. I've got 40, 45 students on Monday night from all over Chattanooga and from South Pittsburgh and North Alabama and North Georgia that will come over there and intently study the book of Proverbs. That's wonderful. We all need to have the attitude that Paul says that Timothy is supposed to have here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 
Study or give diligence to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, rightly dividing the word of truth sounds a whole lot like let's be balanced in our approach to the scriptures. Let's make sure that we do not apply an Old Testament rule to a New Testament situation. Let's make sure that we don't use the argument, well, David played the harp, therefore we ought to be able to use instruments in worship. That makes about as much sense as us going out here and trying to find out what gopher wood is so we can start building an ark. That's not a law under which we are required to live. But that comes from not just sitting in the right place, not the air blowing through your head at the right way, but from an intent study of the scriptures. Now let's apply this principle real quickly in this lesson. Are we balanced? Let's see. We've got the right authority for what we do. I mean, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Can't improve on that, can you? Colossians 3, verse 17. We must do what we do according to God's revealed truth. Well, is that all that's required? Well, no. Is it required? Absolutely. But friends and brethren, along with the right authority, we also must have the right affection, the right attitude. Right? Notice another contrast. Soundness? Are we concerned about being sound? Well, we better be. You see, that's a term that has reference to spiritual healthiness. When somebody is sound in body and sound in bone, you know, that means they don't have any diseases. And when somebody is sound spiritually, that means they don't have any spiritual diseases. So we want to be sound. But at the same time, don't we want to be sensitive as well to others? Can we choose one and let go of the other? No, can't do it. And what about coming down on the right position? Well, there's no doubt about it. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, all you are is just a, a, a rule obeyer. Well, all you are is a rule breaker. I believe I'd rather be a rule obeyer than a rule breaker. Well, you're not God. Well, you're not either. Now what are we going to do? You know, we can dance around like that all night. While we know we must have the right position, not simply a position that somebody else held that we thought highly of, but a position that the Bible teaches, but at the same time, does not the Bible as well teach that we're supposed to have the right disposition? Let me tell you something, friends and brethren. If it does not bother a person to see other folks leaving this world lost, there's a problem with that person. If I have an opportunity to help a person see the truth so that they might avoid hell, then don't I have a responsibility to do what I can to help them see that? Do I not demonstrate my compassion and care for them by doing that very thing? And do I not demonstrate a lack of, of appreciation and a lack of love by playing shut mouth when I ought to be talking? Friends and brethren, silence is sometimes golden but at other times it's just plain old yellow we better know the difference we better know when to speak and we better know when to be quiet and I'm afraid that far too many have bit their tongue when they should have been talking just as people have talked when they should have been biting their tongue these are things we must be concerned about and as we have illustrated in just about every lesson this week, these are ways in which we can demonstrate before the world what the true people of God are. And while people in the world may not know what a genuine child of God is, even when they see one, we need to live that life before them so they'll get a pretty good picture. And we can do it. We can do it. And as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, we can do no better. Now, in this second chapter, very quickly, there are four points that Paul makes that helps us to be able to be balanced in this matter. Notice the first thing. And this will just have to fly through this material. So hang on. 
The first thing, we have to be concerned about feelings. Don't ever jump to the conclusion that feelings don't matter. While feelings are obviously not the standard, the way we do feel is important. We want to feel the right way about things. You know, Jesus loves me, this I know, because I feel it so strongly right here in the pit of my stomach. That's not the way that goes, is it? Jesus loves me, this I know, because I had a warming sensation one time when I went. That's not the way the song goes. The song says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now why does it say that? It's because that's the only way we know that Jesus loves us. It's not because of the way we feel. It's because that's the clear declaration of the scripture. And if the scripture did not say that, we would not know that. Therefore, the necessity of feeling the right way based upon the right thing and the testimony of God cannot be improved upon. Notice the examples that Paul uses here in this first part of this chapter. He talks about, first, the motivation of the soldier. The motivation of the soldier. And then he talks about the motivation of an athlete. And then he talks about the motivation of a farmer. What's the purpose of putting examples like that before us? Well, just about all of us could relate to at least one of them. You know, Some could probably relate to all three. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the things of this world because he wants to please him who's chose him to be a soldier. How do you feel about the Lord's leading in your life? How are you open and receptive to what the Lord would have you to do? Do you feel good about that or do you feel like that that constricts you and, and doesn't really let you enjoy life to its fullest? Well, let me tell you something. If that's the attitude you possess, you're not going to be a very good soldier. If you're trying to make money off of people that you're in service with instead of being concerned about the enemy, I don't want you in my platoon. If you're not in realization that we're in a battle and that souls are in the balances, then you're not going to be doing anything but hindering the cause on the battlefield, folks. And while we understand that clearly from a physical war, the principle holds true in a spiritual war. If I'm more concerned with things that doesn't have anything to do with our success or failure in the battle that we're involved in, then I am going to be detrimental to the cause of which I'm a part. We understand that. Same thing holds true in the field of sports. Here's a person who will sacrifice day in and day out. He will take his body and do everything he can to his body to try to get even more activity out of it. He will deprive himself of things that taste real good, but he knows it's going to be detrimental to his ability and his stamina. Why does he do all those things? Because he wants to complete the race at the very earliest time. He wants to set a better pace than he did the last time. Why does he do that? It's because he's committed to being the very best athlete he can be. And what about the farmer? Does he care whether he has any tomatoes to eat at the end of the season or not? Well, he does if he's trying to feed his family. He does if he knows that that's going to keep him from having to buy that much more stuff at Walmart. If he's saving money by growing crops. His motivation is what it is if he's committed to that which he's involved in. In the same sort of way, we must have the right attitude towards the Lord as he leads us through his word, realizing that that is where grace is found. It's in Christ Jesus. But notice that. If we do not have the proper focus in what we're doing, then we're going to be going in the opposite direction of where we're supposed to be going. We're not going to be able to be balanced. When it comes to the proper focus, there have been times, we may, uh, Ron made the observation last night, as to there was a false teacher who began teaching his false ways right after he left teaching at Fred Hardeman back in the mid-70s and moved to Nashville and started uh, writing some things and, and all, and because he and my father had the same first name, then some people have got them mixed up. And poor Ron was afraid that that fellow was preaching in Python. He was going to have to have to deal with his kind of mess. 
But the fact of the matter is, if when that fellow was destroying so many things that he in fact had helped build up in his earlier days, if a preacher went to the pulpit and every sermon revolved around something that he had done that past week, is, is, is that preacher balanced? Well, of course not. Let me ask you this. If that fella was exerting an influence, uh, maybe on some of the children within the congregation because they happened to be going to a university that was in the same proximity of where this man was preaching, and that preacher never even mentioned his name, would that preacher be balanced? No, he wouldn't. You see, we understand what balanced is. And to be properly balanced, there has to be a clear focus of what we're trying to accomplish. Friends, Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. He gave his life as a ransom for lost mankind. That must always be our focus. Since the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth, what Jesus is all about, his church must be as well. We want souls to be saved. We don't want people to watch these sermons on the, on the internet just so they say, well, isn't that, buddy, I mean, South Pittsburgh, they're really up to speed. I mean, they're right in line. They're, they're modern, boy, they got a website and all that. No. It's the message of Jesus Christ that will save the world that's important. The means that we get it out there doesn't matter. But we must use every means at our, at our disposal to do it. We must be. We have to be properly focused. And then the next point. In order for us to be balanced, we can never underestimate the power of fellowship with God. We received a phone call not too long ago on our radio program, television program on Wednesday morning. And the woman asked this question. Said, why ain't y'all, that's the way she said it, talks just like I would. Why ain't y'all members of the Sequatchie Valley Fellowship of Churches? Why ain't y'all members of the Sequatchie Valley Fellowship of Churches? And so, for about 15 minutes, I explained it to her. I said there was a, this shows you how, how times change so quickly. About 20 years ago, and this is the first time that it happened. In New York City, for the St. Patrick's Day Parade, there were some Catholic homosexuals that wanted to march in the St. Patrick's Day Parade under the banner of gay Catholics. Okay. And there were a bunch of people who caused a great uproar and said if that was allowed to happen, they were not going to be aiding and abetting their influence by marching in the parade. I said, that's why we're not in the Sequatchie Valley Fellowship of Churches. We're not on the same page with those people. We're not trying to accomplish the same thing. It's the same reason why when you look in the Chattanooga or you look in the Dunlap Tribune or you look in the shop each week, then when you get around Christmas time, you will not see the Dunlap Church of Christ listed along with all the rest of the religious organizations in the county celebrating the birthday of Jesus, nor celebrating Easter as one day in the year. You don't see it there either. It's the same principle. And to promote the idea that there's some type of fellowship that exists between these divided, contradictory religious groups is a joke. If they are in such wonderful fellowship, why do they not even call themselves the same thing? Why do they meet in different buildings? Why do some of them meet on Saturday and some of them meet on Sunday? Why do some of them believe that there's only one person in the Godhead and some of them teach that there's three? Why do some of them demand that you be buried in water in baptism and some say you can sprinkle? Why do some of them say you can have women preachers and others say, no, you can't? That don't sound like fellowship to me. Now, you might call it the Sequatchie Valley Fellowship of, of Churches, but it's not really that. 
It's a conglomeration of religious people that are seeking to accomplish something, but it's not what the Bible teaches ought to be accomplished. Therefore, to have anything to do with it is to aid and abet that which is destined to fail. That's why. And just a little bit of Bible understanding would show that to be clear. Isn't it amazing that in 2 John 9, John says, and this is in a period of time in which there were people traveling around. There was an internet. There wasn't phones. They didn't have the ability to keep up with things as easily as we can keep up with things today if we really want to. And so here was an elect lady that is addressed by John the Apostle. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If any man come to you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deed. Now what does that mean? That means that if you aid and abet a false teacher, it's the same as you doing the false teaching. Now, I don't do that. Woe unto false teachers. And we don't want to be guilty of that. Fellowship with God, that's listen. And here you've got people mentioned right here. Hymenaeus and Philetus. They were overthrowing the faith of some. Are they in fellowship with God? Well, if they're in fellowship with God, then I want to be in fellowship with them, don't you? But if they're not in fellowship with God, then I'm not going to be in fellowship with them. That's why we must recognize in this matter of balance and the last point, that we must recognize the fellowship that we have with brethren. Now here's a principle. And it goes back to, to what was finally taught, this lesson that was taught to Peter at Joppa when he was in the middle of the day hungry. And the statement that's made by God, what God hath cleansed, do not call common or unclean. Now, that's a principle of fellowship. Right? What God has made pure and clean, guess what? That's what we must be in fellowship. That's what we want to encourage. That's what we want to support. That's what we want to be. Well, can we really know, you know? Can we really know who's in fellowship with God and who's not? You see, we are limited in our abilities by what we can hear and by what we can see by the information that we can take in. But based upon the information that we can take in, we certainly can draw a pretty good conclusion as to who's in fellowship with God or not. When someone stands opposed to the clear and undeniable truth of God relative to what must I do to be saved, then we know of a surety there's an individual who's not in fellowship with God. When someone thinks that they do not need to be restricted by the requirements of acceptable worship, then there's a pretty good indication there's a person that's not in fellowship with God. When a person treats a bound matter as if it is a loose matter or treats a loose matter as if it is a bound matter, there's a pretty good indication that such individuals are not in fellowship with God. Therefore, I cannot aid them in their efforts when they're not in fellowship with God. I want to be in fellowship with God. And the way it's always worked is those who are in fellowship with God are of necessity then in fellowship with each other. Are you in fellowship with God? Am I in fellowship with God? If we are, then we're in fellowship with each other. And it's the direct result of the blood of Jesus Christ being applied to our lives and grant us, granting us that special privilege. Are we balanced? Right authority, right affection. Soundness? Sensitivity. Right position? Absolutely. But at the same time, the right disposition. Did you realize even in this congregation right here, you've got all different levels of spiritual maturity? You do. You've got people that have been members of the body of Christ for scores of years, for, say, centuries. Not that, not like that many. And you've got people that's been members of the church for a short period of time. You've got people at one time obeyed the gospel, but were not faithful very long, went out back into the world, and now have come home. You've got people that those squandered years there caused you to get behind. Even though you're of an age where you should be more knowledgeable because of failure and foolish choices, you're not where you could be and should be. But you'll get there. You'll get to where you need to be. God has never expected out of anybody anything they could not do. But he's always expected what we can do.
And if we do what God has blessed us with the ability to do, He promises us we'll be able to do more. Let's be faithful with the talents that God has blessed us with. And friends and brethren, I promise you, we will have a home in heaven one day. God has a simple plan. You've got to hear the truth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Inclusive of that which you hear is that Jesus Christ is who He claimed to be. If you don't believe that, you'll die in your sins. You've got to repent of your sins or perish. You've got to confess the name of Christ that He is in fact who He claimed to be, the Son of God, and you've got to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins so that the Lord might add you to His church. Maybe you've obeyed that gospel plan in times past, but going back into sin. Don't you think, at, here at the end of a gospel meeting, it's time to renew your determination to return to faithfulness and from this day forward, no longer play church, but be a faithful child of God for the remainder of your days and encouraging those within your sphere of influence to do exactly the same thing. God will bless you for it. Let us know how we can help you while together we stand and while we sing. Love you,